uh, keep with some time here. So Jeff, let me bring you up here. If you want, or you can take this no, one. No, then you know I have to suit up again. I think I'm on your first one. Is that right? Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you for attending. You know, some of you uh, had to go away to do this, and I appreciate uh, all the folks from the other states that are uh, attending, and also the live streamers. So, as a weed scientist, I've been corn soybean weed management specialist uh, since 1986. So, I've seen some things. And uh, overall, one of the things I want to accomplish this morning is, so why focus on Palmer amaranth? There's plenty of other weeds in the queue, especially in corn and soybeans. Um, but besides the fact that I'm going to demonstrate in a, in a little bit that it's a very, uh, very aggressive weed, um, I also Really, my focus has been, it's also a wake-up call regarding the perils of herbicide resistance. And this goes back to the general principles as an IPM specialist in weed science, integrated weed management. For since, definitely since the 90s, we've been taking some very simple approaches to corn soybean weed management. And as you can see in this cartoon, ultimately, with these complex situations, simple's easy, but it doesn't last long. Complex, a um, much harder thing. So if anything else, what I've been doing with working uh, the last uh, two weeks, I've been out doing Ag Professional Update Series, really, if nothing else, on some of these issues, getting people to just stop and think about the seriousness of this issue. Along that line, what I've been explaining to people is you'll notice in the lower uh, right-hand corner, Palmer amaranth is what I consider but one aspect of the resistance issue. And it's a tangled web, and part of my goal as an educator is how do we untangle this web. And I can make the case very readily that Palmer amaranth, well, make the case, is tied to multiple resistant weeds. So a weed that has multiple resistance characteristics, so you, therefore you're losing your tools. It's a mobile weed. That's what Tony's talking about with pathways. We've had a lot of issues with dicamba over the last couple of years. So that's been working with another part of the Minnesota Department of Ag Agencies on, on that issue. Um, and one of those issues, if you look US-wide, where Palmer amaranth is a really big deal, the further south you go, one of the things you consistently hear is we need the dicamba technology because of this weed. Um, I can question that, but my point is it's much better to not have to deal with the weed significantly in the first place. It's a tool, but again, overusing the tool can create other problems, both social problems as well as economic and environmental problems. And the same goes with herbicide carryover, adding another product to some of these late emerging weeds, you tend to take herbicides out of their system where they break down and don't affect rotational crops, and you're moving it out into areas where you see more problems. It also ties back, being an integrated standpoint, soybean cyst nematode, uh, iron chlorosis, things that stunt the rate of growth and development of the soybean canopy. Soybean canopies are free weed control, okay? So, in a sense, more holistically, it's a whole cropping systems issue is what we're dealing with. But in the point of this discussion is, taking the pressure off of an aggressive weed like this can really help us get our head around the broader issue. Regarding multiple resistance, if you look at the left, the absolutely most challenging weed US-wide and in this state is common water hemp. One of the issues is, Common water hemp is also an amaranth or a pigweed like palmer. Okay, they both have male and female plant parts, plants, so it's, that's a challenge in identification. But you see all those numbers up there, 2, 4, 5, 9, 14, 27. Those represent classes of herbicides. Okay, classes of herbicides we call sites of action. Across the U.S., we know that there are water hemp that are um, resistant to these, these classes. Palmer isn't too far behind, and this is a dynamic situation. Okay? But the case is, is some of these weeds can be resistant to multiple classes of herbicides. 
Currently, the record holder is water hemp. Um, in, I think it's Missouri, has resistant to uh, all six of those classes of herbicides. Now, the problem with that is there's only about three effective sites of action that are left for water hemp that it hasn't yet a resist, resolved resistance to. Okay? And when you have resistance in a field, you have uncertainty. You don't really know what your best strategy is in these situations. So the point I focus on water hemp is because it's so closely related to Palmer, is that when you look at this, this is a warning, okay? Multiple resistance, these sort of issues, they, they track one another very consistently. In Minnesota, our water hemp, we have only three sites of action that we know it's resistant to, but we have two more that we're also concerned with. So corn soybean farmers, the point of this is you're losing the number of herbicide tools available to you. And so in that context, you really have to start thinking more broadly back to integrated weed management. The other thing about this whole issue is from a standpoint of weed science, I think in many ways we've underestimated weeds' ability to move. They can move, especially the resistance traits can move. Pollen can move about the length of a football field and still be viable, so it can go to a neighbor's field. If you have another water hemp or palmer there, it can induce the, possibly some resistance traits into that plant. But also the long distance aspects, but kochia, windborne movement, okay? giant ragweed from fence rows into fields. <clears throat> and this actually over here is actually in the south. They put 20,000 seeds, known seeds of Palmer amaranth. And three years later, all they did for weed control, it was glyphosate resistant, is glyphosate weed control. In three years, you can see the nice uniform spread that the combine delivers out in these fields. So lots of pathways, and these are some of the more common ones, probably along with water movement. So we talked about the resistance issue, but Palmer amaranth is formidable just based on its biology. And, and I got this quote from Aaron Hager, a colleague of mine at the University of Illinois. But uh, Mark, uh, Wisconsin is quite ahead of its time in 1957. I was a mere youth. but. Uh, I was a youth. Of all the dioecious amaranth, that's male and female, Palmer has been by far the most successful as a weedy invader of artificial habitats, whether they were prepared by primitive or modern technology. I'm not quite sure what they mean by primitive, but the point is it's, it's been a known challenging weed. As Tony mentioned, one of the things in extension that we've done ahead of this issue three, four, five years out is the identification is challenging. So we were looking to our neighbors to the south, and I was at North Carolina State for my PhD. I'd been in Iowa, Iowa Extension before that. I could see that some of these weeds, water hemp, palmer amaranth, were present there, but never a real big issue until herbicide resistance took hold. But one of the key things is identification. And hopefully, if you didn't notice the posters on the way in, You'll really look at them at breaks or at lunch because there's some really key identification characteristics there where Palmer separates itself even from about a four to six inch height <clears throat> is it has very long petioles, the stem that connects the leaf, the leaf to the stem, that piece, very long. Unfortunately, that's your best vegetative characteristic when it's small. When it's larger, when it's the female plants have what we call spiny bracts on the seed head and even down where the seeds are forming down by the, the stem itself. <clears throat> they're only on the female plant, but, but they're spiny. Just give them a little squeeze, you'll find out. Male and female seed heads are really long, a couple feet tall. That's why they're usually nodding. And the male seed head is just for the pollen. It is not spiny. But when you start looking at that, at small seedlings, all of these things look alike. So the genetic analysis that Tony's talking about is very important. The big deal. A single water hemp plant 
even with some competition, can easily reach 500,000 seeds per plant. That's a high numbers game. The other issues are this prolonged emergence pattern, May through July. Okay, in many cases, what we know in the south, it's even more extended emergence period than what we see with water hemp, which is giving us enough trouble. They can germinate in high numbers. That's the bad news. The good news is high germination rates mean if you can go with zero tolerance and not allow any seed to go away, um, get back into the seed bank, you can wear that seed bank out in about three to four years to a much more manageable level. It also likes very high temperatures. It's native to the desert southwest, so drought, all these things. It's a very durable plant. My concern, when it was detected, it's a very aggressive plant. Okay? It can grow quickly. It can reach 68 feet tall. And yield loss potential under dense populations is, is very, very high in corn and soybeans. Okay? Now let's go back to that two to three inch tall growth rate. Let's go back and you say you have a post-emergence after the weed and crop have emerged. You have, you have an opportunity to spray this X herbicide that's still susceptible to. But to be effective, generally you need weeds at four inch weeds or less. Here's an example out of Tennessee. This particular herbicide is effective on Palmer if sprayed on three inch weeds or less, okay? But they got delayed over on this other field by two days. That's your window of opportunity. Yikes, okay? That creates a lot of management problems for, for growers. That's why this eradication of attempt, this proactive approach, I think is so important for the upper Midwest. Other challenges, we'll be getting into seed testing in a little bit, okay? You know all the size of what an energy, uh, Energizer AAA battery looks like. In that vial, there's enough seed to put one seed per square foot on an acre of land, all right? The other thing is, if you're trying to clean a combine, okay, or if you're trying to do a seed test, looking for that palmer amaranth, you're really, really extremely challenged in, in this activity. But the genetic analysis that we'll get into has been a big help. My point with this weed as a weed scientist is there's no single tactic that's gonna keep you palmer amaranth from reducing crop re yield. It's not gonna happen just with herbicides. We're gonna need a more integrated approach Okay, and the first step of that is to reduce the population intensity in the first place and not let it go to seeds. We have to recognize the biology and growth characteristics of Palmer amaranth to deal with this. These emergence periods, the duration, growth rate, all of these things matter. That's why your rest of your cropping system really matters. Crop rotation, rate of canopy closure, as I mentioned before, all of these things play into managing this weed. What I found in this working with the MDA on this particular issue is to really be on top of this, and it's been working quite well, is to untangle this web, cooperation, coordination, and communication. And I have this triangle here. What Minnesota Extension, we've been doing for a number of years, we have a long-standing relationship with the crop consultant, the advisors to farmers, and the farmers themselves, okay? That's where early on, the weed identification of this thing all came through a consultant relationship with a farmer. And the consultant learned about identification in this weed through our Minnesota Extension programs that we have. So that had been in place for a long time. As the issue broke, then making the connections to MDA have been very, very important, as Tony explained. But the other thing that happens then in that relationship is it's, it's up to, to, say, Extension and MDA to really create that trust with a consultant and farmer. It doesn't mean you're a bad farmer if you have the weed. It doesn't mean, you know, that if you do this that there's going to be some fine or leveraging. All of these things are important if we want that trust 
to get early reporting, zero tolerance on this weed, and start thinking strategically. The other thing about it is, when you have this weed like this or an issue, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk to your neighbor about it, okay? You don't want to be, in the words of this one farmer, I don't want to be that guy who had the Palmer amaranth. But breaking down that, inf that barrier, I think, is very important to get on top of early reporting. So taking control of this, these are some of the ways of ta talking about this untangled web. And today we're working on coordination and communication. I would also say that it hopefully will inform community-based communication as well. A lot of these other issues, that's what we're working with with the crop consultants and the farmers. So with that, Tony, I've set the stage for the, the Palmer on uh, next phase of the discussion. So 